Hello, everyone, and welcome to the EVN Disrupt podcast. My name is Nejda Zadurian. I'm the editor of the creative tech section here at EVN Report. This week, we are continuing our series of podcasts from the Science and Technology Convergence Conference. We were happy to be the media partner of the STC conference, which was organized by SmartGate's Catalyst Foundation, with the support of the European Union and the GIZ Foundation. Our guests this week are the co-founders of a Danish space tech company called Space Tech Denmark. The CEO, Sheila Christensen, and the CTO, Alex Chere, share with us how they are building at the intersection of IoT and space tech, specifically satellite communications, and solving real-world problems in logistics, smart agriculture, and education. Thank you for listening. Thank you both so much for being with us today. So you guys are uh, a company that's in a couple of different spaces, I think it's fair to say. Some of the stuff you guys do is is involved in space, um, as the name of the company suggests. Tell us, what was it about space and how young were you guys when you first sparked your curiosity and excitement about space first? Well, first of all, everything we do is in space because right. all of the, <laughs> all, no matter which application we're involved in, we're right. transferring the data through our satellites in space. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, But my space interest started actually when I was really young. I was three or four years old and my parents read books to me. I believe it was my grandfather. He he read me a book about the first people on the moon. And I asked questions because it didn't look like home in the pictures. I said, where are they at? What are they doing? And and they they were they were in the middle of the air with these bubbly suits, you know, and I I could see they weren't like being pulled to the ground. I said, why are they flying or and they said, oh, it's, they're not flying there. Just there's a lack of gravity there. There's less gravity. So when you take a step, you kind of kind of fly. It's mm-hmm. called being weightless. Right. And to me, I was just like, oh, my goodness. Being weightless must be the coolest thing in the yeah. world, right? So um, to me, it started with the dream of going to the moon yeah. um, when I was like three or four years old. Now I'm 41. So it's, <laughs> it's been a long journey. I actually was uh, the first... Uh, well, Denmark has never had a female astronaut, so I became an astronaut candidate for Denmark wow. last year, but I I didn't make it past the second round, so oh, okay. Um, that's okay. Nice I'm, I'm still going. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm still going. Yeah, it's just day. their opinion. But, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but yeah, so I did get to do the zero-G flight. Oh, you did do the flight? Yes, oh, yes, yeah, awesome. yeah. I yeah. got to be weightless. Yeah. I did a two... Um, moon gravitational flights uh-huh. and I did one Mars gravity and yeah. then I did 13 zero gravity. Yeah. I, I have to do that one day. I know it, it costs so much money, but I, I have to do it one day. Do it instead of, <laughs> instead of, convince your, 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 when you get married, let's not have a wedding. Let's just yeah, go zero that's G. That's such a good <laughs> idea. I'm completely on board. <laughs> yeah. It probably wedding costs zero G. Yeah. We'll take a minister up with us. Alex, let's get your story. Yeah, well, for me, uh, unlike for most other space enthusiasts, the, the interest started much later. I think I was around 15 or so. And I think that's simply because uh, I was born in Romania and wasn't exposed to the possibilities that space offers. Yeah. It was first when I moved to Denmark at the age of 15, I saw it uh, through uh, uh, space communications, satellite communications. Yeah, uh, th- th- that interest fostered an education which was somehow related in science and physics. What did you study? I, I studied physics, Okay. you know, real or academical physics, yeah. but I couldn't get a job or it wasn't interesting to work as a physicist for me. So I worked in engineering mm-hmm. in the space industry uh, on and off uh, space industry and satellite communication. That, uh, that, that part was kind of ongoing for my yeah. whole life. And uh, when I met Sheila in uh, 2018, that's also how uh, we met. Yeah. Oh and yeah, we were building rockets. We were building rockets, yeah, in our spare time. Yeah. Like, <laughs> as a hobby. Like, like yeah. model rockets or? Uh, no, uh, rockets, real rockets, rockets, suborbital real rockets, rockets oh, for wow. for crude rockets for, for a human. Uh, for what? Uh, Copenhagen suborbitals. Oh wow! What were what were the mission purposes? To make a human go into a suborbital flight and for him to come safely back to Earth yeah. and tell us what it was like. Was it a private industry? Uh, no, it was crowdfunded. It was a hobby. Oh, wow. Amateur rocket. So and we won world's world first rockets. and only amateur uh, rocket club wow, uh, with ambitions hobby. to send a human into space. <laughs> yeah, uh, and with incredible. success. I mean, we have a full flight path success story yeah. of all of our systems from on the last rocket. Mm-hmm. And so I was on the capsule team and I was live stream host and then, and then I was capsule lead where Alex, he was on the communications. And did you guys ever launch people with the rocket? Not yet. 
it's in the plan. We've launched seven rockets so far. Wow. Incredible. Okay. All right. It seems like we could talk about these things with you guys for hours. But. I just wanted to mention that I think it's really interesting because now we're in Armenia. And, yeah. he, you know, I thought it was interesting to talk about the, the fact that Alex's interest in space didn't come till later because he was in an environment right. where space was so out of reach. And I think that's a huge handicap that a lot of us assume, even as children. Or like if you tell your parents and when you're 10 years old, I want to be a space engineer, mo many parents might say, because they want their children to have success, they might say, why don't you become a doctor or something, right. you know, um, <laughs> something more normal. Right. Um, so I think part of the mistake we make is assuming that it's out of reach. Right. You have to dream big. Right. Right. And so what happened with Alex was he came to Denmark and he became a member of a radio club okay. where he became really good at understanding frequency and radio frequencies. And uh, this you can do as early as 15. I think you can become a member of a ham radio club. And the way we communicate with ham radio is the exact same way you communicate with the spacecraft. With the rockets. So if you, as a 15-year-old, can communicate with other people around the planet, you can also communicate with a satellite. Yeah. This is a skill set that a lot of people don't understand, that these old radio clubs can provide you with space engineering skills. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's it's interesting. You know, through these conversations, we constantly we constantly see that there are skill sets and education paths that are we think of as are intended for completely other things but they're so applicable in other areas like it could be you know non-traditional ways of getting into biotech and now this is a way you're saying of getting into rocketry and aerospace maybe also music engineers music engineers they work with wavelengths all the time yeah. in different layers and signal uh, they treat the signal they have filters just yeah. like we have filters on our you know so uh music engineers could be great space engineers also right. i mean right Okay, very cool. Let's mix it up. Yeah. yeah hope, Just like Star Mist, right? Yeah. 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 Music yeah. and science yeah. together. Yeah. So speaking yeah. of Star Mist, uh, <laughs> let's let's first mention that. So uh, your company is Space Tech Denmark and you guys are based in Denmark. That's right. Um, so your first trip to Armenia was a few weeks ago at Star Mist. And now you guys have come back for the Science and Technology Convergence Conference. Tell us a little bit about what your first initial thoughts on both Armenia and the Armenian scientific and tech ecosystems are. How has your experience been so far? I love rich cultures. I love, I mean, come on, I wanted to go to the moon and explore right. the moon. So right. coming to Armenia, one of the oldest uh, Christian countries on the planet, I, was an exciting event for me. Arriving at night and then being in the taxi, yeah. listening to the local music, um, looking at uh, your beautiful language on your <laughs> your writing. It looks like wavelengths. <laughs> <laughs> it's the scientist brain. Yeah. <laughs> I think your, your, your letters are so pretty. <laughs> um, so that was the cultural bit. And then I was I was amazed at the openness and the that I feel so welcome here. Yeah. That I, I and the food is so delicious and everything. And then I was shocked that you have so many resources. Because you might stereotype a Middle Eastern country like desert, but you have water just for free, just trickling down the mountain, right? right? And you have sun all day long, so you have renewable energy source. You have wind every night, almost. Right. I mean, it's almost like a constant. So, so to me, it's a land of a lot of rich possibilities. Your people are great. Your resources are great. So I think that, and then you have the skill set that you're you're awesome at the digital digital things you may not have a launch pad you may not have rockets and stuff but you're great at what you do right. and i think we need to take that and kind of like slide it into some space infrastructure yeah. so that we can help monitor all these resources and actually tap into what armenia has to offer mm -hmm. so that that to me is very evident here at this conference that and that there's a big motivation and that you can't purchase you can't learn it in school you can't right. it's you hard know, to purchase it in a store right. you either have it or you don't right. so i think I mean, I'm getting goosebumps because I think like it's it's exciting time for Armenia, I think, right yeah. now. Well, it's always interesting to hear that perspective from someone coming from outside uh, yeah. because often the, our, our narratives that we say are much, much, maybe some, sometimes more grim and not as hopeful uh, yeah. as hearing it from you guys. But that's a really interesting perspective to hear. Um, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I was uh, surprised. So I, I, I try when I come to a new, new country not to have any expectations or anything because yeah. then it, you just experience it as it right. is. And I don't know if it's because I was born in Romania that I have a also, you know, culture closer, but I was surprised how similar it is. It is different and it is very unique, but you get so quickly used to it. Uh, yeah. Like you mentioned, the people are friendly. We feel welcome. We feel safe. Uh, now uh, we are here the second time. We know how to order a taxi yeah. and everything, how to <laughs> you guys pay we're the restaurant. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 
The only thing I'm gonna eat a shrimp tonight. Okay? Yeah. The only thing we need, the only thing we're missing, we need to learn the language. But other than that, it's uh, it's uh, Feel more feels like a second home already after time, the yeah. second time. Yeah. So awesome. it's yeah. I uh, I was really surprised that a country so far away compared to other countries in Europe, it's so similar so in many ways. Yeah. Glad to hear that. You guys are so nice. You're so open yeah. and friendly and. I'm glad you guys are, yeah. have had such a good experience so far in Armenia. But wouldn't it be great if we could get your tomatoes in Denmark? Because um, your tomatoes are so delicious. Find, find a way to export them. <laughs> if I put some data on it, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you can rovers. grow more and then you can export yeah. them to me. No. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about your company, Space Tech Denmark. Tell us what you guys do. We deliver um, turnkey solutions for our customers with the satellite communication modem that uh, collects data on things. So basically, if you want to wrap it up short, we do SATCOM IoT. Okay. But that sounds like a lot of buzzwords, right? So basically, many industries have areas, or not many industries, I would say all industries have some area where if you collected some data on how they run their bus business and how they collect their revenue. Yeah. So for example, you're a farmer. Um, you have to, let's talk about tomatoes. You have to grow a lot of tomatoes to to pay your bills every month, right? But of course, if you could monitor the soil, the moisture in the soil, and you know exactly when the tomato plants want water, you can make the tomato plant grow 30% more tomatoes. Right. But if you're just watering it every day, regular basis, fertilizing all the plants the same, no matter where in the field they are, um, you're not going to get that many tomatoes. You, right. that's, a, that's how we traditionally farm around the world. But with smart farming, we see a 30% growth in harvest. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's just farming. Then you can say um, like uh, construction sites. Knowing hiring 12 electricians to install wires around the building, they arrive on Monday, but the wires, they didn't get there till Friday. Okay. If you had, you spent now a ton of money and a people's time, human resources are the most expensive resources. Right. Um, if you had known that the wires weren't going to be there till Friday, you could have adjusted your business, mm -hmm. right? The same thing if you're monitoring caviar or Corona vaccines or body parts or fine art. Uh, the very expensive goods, like a liver is, an, is a very costly good. Yeah. You want to, if you're transporting it, be monitoring it. Um, these type of things are before uh, these very costly goods like caviar and body parts. Things. You, it was worth monitoring, right? But it was very expensive. So you uh -huh. have to weigh up how expensive is the good compared to how expensive is it to monitor it. Right. So if you've decided, well, I'm shipping 200,000 Corona vaccine containers around the planet. To monitor each and every one would cost, I'm just making something up, a million dollars, right? Okay. But each container is only worth $100,000 worth of Corona vaccines. So at what point does it make sense to start monitoring them, right? But now we can deliver with our device. It collects temperature, uh, light, uh, vibrations, whatever you want to monitor, CO2 flux in the Amazon or whatever you want to monitor forest fires yeah and it will collect the data and send it to a satellite and you can have the data on your computer within 15 minutes yeah that means now you can activate the airport and say look there's a plane landing with some corona vaccines when the la plane lands you need to put that vaccines in the freezer right away because right. it will spoil if you don't right but you don't want to pay to put it in the freezer if it doesn't need to go right because that's also a waste of energy and co2 right. and money and time and everything so it's so, more data driven decision making yeah. so the our devices they basically they collect data uh, for any application you want we can change the sensors on there we can customize the the cabinet meaning it needed to be waterproof if you want it to go on a rocket it needs to be able to tolerate some vibrations we're talking uh, hoping that we can get our technology on the moon, you know. So we have different applications, uh, like the educational device. It doesn't need to, the sensors on our educational device doesn't need to be uh, very precise. Yeah. Because to teach children about IoT, we don't need to know the exact temperature. We just need to need the, the change of, of something, right? Before we get to the educational device, tell us a little bit about the, the so the sensor is your main product, is my understanding. And you guys... no. So that's not true. Okay. The sensors is just something that we purchase from people that produce sensors. Okay. Yeah, we're not a specialties. We're, we're, our specialty is space radio frequency. Got it. So, so you we are use using the sensors our, to send the data um, to your SACOMs. And, and we then, use the sensors to collect the data. Right. And then the data is sometimes processed on board our device with a processor. Mm -hmm. But we can also send the raw data. So depending on the customer... Um, like if you need quick decisions, you, you want process data, maybe, you right. know, like forest fire monitoring. But if you're trying to see what can I change in my business to make um, these 
freezers last longer, right. you know, then you want the raw data so right. that you can make your own trend lines. So we use the sensors to collect the data. The, the data is then either processed or sent raw to the satellites. The satellites send it back down to the ground station. Yeah. And from there, it's dispersed to the users. And they make decisions using that data. Yeah. What are some of the primary verticals you guys are in? So that's a business word. I don't really, I'm not, I mean, you, people use it all the time. Vertical, yeah. you mean? I, I just learned them recently. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> Uh, it, it's uh, so we have uh, education, logistics, shipping and logistics, and uh, smart agriculture. We are also looking into the energy sector. Oh, what uh, markets we're in? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, so they, these are the four uh, main yeah. verticals. Can you yeah. speak a little bit about agriculture? Because that that's something that that's a big part of Armenia's economy. I'm curious, what is it that you guys do for for smart agriculture? Well, we do uh, crop monitoring. Um, it could be there's so many applications in smart farming. Um, it could be anything also that you don't think is smart farming, mm -hmm. like the solar panels. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. So when is there dust on the solar panels? When do you need to clean off the dust? It could be a weather uh, weather application. Yeah. Um, monitoring the rainfall and the Mm -hmm. and the gas is coming off the field maybe mm -hmm. they want to monitor that it could be monitoring moisture the fertilizer it could also be drones uh, equipped with some monitoring it could be uh, the greenhouses that uh, have some monitoring and all of this can be collected and sent to our device yeah and either again processed on the device for the ease of the farmer but sometimes maybe if it's a big farm like some in places in south america you see huge farms like yeah um, they're quite tech savvy, you mm -hmm. know, and they might want that data themselves so right. that they can optimize they their business. The raw data. Yeah. yeah. Do you guys build some of the software as well to do that processing or? We build all, all the software. Well, mm -hmm. I'll let the CTO yes. answer. <laughs> yeah. So as Sheila mentioned in the beginning, we try to deliver turnkey solutions that are easy to use or basically plug and play. Yeah. So therefore, uh, and in addition to the hardware, we do write a lot of software to make it work intelligently. And is it specific for those markets? The yes, software? Uh, there, there is a lot of common uh, core technology, both yeah. in terms of hardware and software, mostly yeah. software. But uh, some parts of it has to be customized yeah. to make it uh, because if you make everything generic, then it will uh, be equally bad for right. everybody. Yes. <laughs> if you uh, try to optimize it uh, just uh, it. to some degree, yeah. then it will be optimal for those use cases right yeah and one uh, thing I, i'd like to add to what uh, these verticals it's because it's not quite agriculture but environmental monitoring that we'd like to do even though it's not the killer business case yes we, it's like uh, methane detection uh, things like that or, uh, yeah uh, so we have uh, the amazon rainforest actually as an end user wow <laughs> yeah we have the brazilian government incredible uh, so we went there for a state visit met their the ministry minister of science technology and innovation um, Brazil produces 12% of the world's produce. Really? I yeah. Don't know that. They have a lot of or, or raw resources, but they also have some crisis management. They have a lot of dams. So Brazil has been 80% renewable energy mm -hmm. since the 80s. Okay. I mean, they're amazing because they have all of these dams. Yeah. But the dams sometimes break. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they flood the nearby areas, of course. And in the poorer villages, a lot of people die. Yeah. So they want monitoring on the dams, like attention monitoring. Yeah. And they want to be able to alert the public the dam is breaking, yeah. evacuate, right? So that's one crisis management they want. They also want to, I think they, you know, Brazil is in a lot of heat all the time about what they're doing with the rainforest because the whole planet feels it's their responsibility to monitor the rainforest because it's our most precious rainforest, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, but so Brazil wants to monitor it better. But they want to also help the the poor villages, some of the, the the indigenous people that live in the Amazon that don't even know, for example, people with my skin color exist. <laughs> um, they didn't even know Corona happened. You know, this is part of the world where it's really isolated community. Yeah, they're so isolated, and even they don't feel they belong to a government of Brazil. To them, that's their forest, and if they want to cut down the trees to be able to feed their children and sell the wood to the West. Mm -hmm. So apparently a lot of countries around the world, they illegally deforest the Amazon forest. So the government says we cannot deny these people to feed their children. Right. They have no respect for our laws. They don't even live in the society where they have laws, you know? Um, but so they want to be able to give off some pieces of the land, for example, and monitor Right. So that they can keep them responsible. Mm -hmm. So they want monitoring on trucks, tractors, uh, like uh, forestry machines, so that when something is being deforested illegally, right. they can keep them responsible. 
mm-hmm. right? And they can get out there quick and they get the message fast enough. They also want to track ocean trash. Mm-hmm. Bristol has a huge coastal line. They have now opened up for uh, offshore wind farming. It was not legal before, but now it's legal. Mm. So they w- also are interested in our devices to monitor the windmills. Yeah, because yeah. to monitor an ocean windmill, <laughs> you have to use a sail out, fly with a drone, right. listen to the engine. But we can do that with our device, yeah. and then they can just stay at their computers and get the data. Yeah. So, so there's a lot of applications yeah. just in like Brazil. The, <laughs> the general theme of what you what you guys are saying is, as the advent of IoT devices becomes more and more spread out throughout society, um, and there's more and more adoption of IoT devices, our data collection capabilities are going to drastically increase and we're going to be able to make better data-driven decisions. What are some of the most impactful areas that we can see, we can expect to see in the next, let's say, decade of how these IoT devices will enable us to, to have better decision-making capabilities? Well, see, in Europe right now, you see a lot of smart buildings. Okay. It's a... Uh, that's where you see the biggest, because most people live in cities, so that's where you'll see it first. Explain um, what a smart building is. A smart building is a building that, for example, when the when the sun is on the east side of the building, the building will turn off the lights on the east side of the building. It will, oh wow, you know, it will turn them up higher on the side where it's dark. Um, it will monitor the air quality inside. Um, so it will also. Um, open windows to let out CO2 when the CO2 level becomes too high in the yeah. building. It will wa- monitor your water meters. Um, yeah. It will monitor your trash so that right now in, a, in the shopping mall, you have people emptying the trash every Tuesday, every Wednesday at 8 in the morning and then again at 1 p.m. You yeah. know, The trash bag might be only the, a little bit full. But the person is going to go by and empty the trash regardless if it's full or not. Right. A smart building would have a meter in the trash saying, now you empty it. Right. If all buildings only had trash and and maintenance when they needed it, when they yeah. were asking for it, you would have 30% less cars in the city. Those 30% people that would normally be driving those trucks, they're now doing something else. Right. Producing more revenue for the your more country. Productive, yeah. yeah. So that's the first place that you see uh, stadiums, um, like big yeah. buildings where, you, where people have invested in making them smart. Yeah. Because you save a ton of money yeah. by making them smart, right? And in fact, in Denmark now, we have such high climate goals. You are not allowed to build a building unless it's smart. Really? Yeah, it's hmm. like a law. Impressive. So, but, but I think the biggest impacts are not in cities. Because only, only 5% of our planet is a city, right? right? Most of our planet is, is far away from a city. Right. I think our biggest impacts will be like in smart agriculture and shipping and logistics. That's where we spend a ton of diesel and energy right. and time to ship goods around the world. And we lose 30% of our goods. Did you know that? What do you mean by lose 30% of our goods? Because we can't monitor them. They go to waste. Oh, the yeah. yield is just not high. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and 30% of the planet has no food. Right. So there's so the 30%. That's a kind of a, a interesting right. study, I think, that maybe we can actually not have a food crisis on our planet if right. we just knew how to monitor them better and transport them better. And be much more efficient. Yeah. yeah. It also I have a good yes. example to yeah. what you just mentioned because when you say lo- food lost, it can be many things stolen, just yeah. disappearing. I think it was in Brazil, uh, somebody described the problem to us that it's it can be like when things are transported by trucks and the roads are bad, they just some of it just simply falls off during transport. Right. But if you also monitor the Actual transport, you know, that now the car is shaking a lot yeah. and you learn the routes and also find more efficient routes, uh, yeah. then uh, that's one of... Uh, yeah. And it's things like that we don't really think about unless we talk to the end users and right. uh, understand yeah. their problems. This has been super insightful because it's, till now I was largely thinking of IoT devices as like, you know, thermostats in your house and maybe like a smart camera or something. Exactly, smart cities. But it's actually yeah. far more about just getting the data to be able to make better decisions. We uh, have these glasses that farmer puts on, not we, yeah. but they exist on, in the industry. Right. They just put on some glasses and then when they're driving in their tractor, they can see through the glass, the satellite data. They can just drive in their tractors um, and put on these glasses and they can just see through the glasses where the field needs water yeah. and they get the data uh, integrated into a screen so they can monitor it wow. with just the glasses because we can't expect farmers to be space engineers. Right, right obviously. So, yeah. <laughs> so a lot of these applications, also the same with the shipping industry. Uh, the people that work in the shipping industry are typically not, you know, astrophysicists or right. um, they're more, you know, harbor workers or right. something. <laughs> right. And they just need things to work. So right. this yeah. industry is really... Uh, hungry mm-hmm. for digitalization mm-hmm. 
And and this industry is probably one of the world's biggest industries, right? Yeah. It sounds like there can also be a lot of impact on climate change. Uh, so if, you, if things fire, like forest fire, monitoring forest fires or methane passions. detection and things like that, like monitoring yeah. dolphins in the sea. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. How far is this polar bear going to travel to eat today right. compared to last year? Right. Yeah. Uh, and where's, uh, uh, no, like there's sensors for the rhinoceros that you put in the nose. Mm hmm. Now uh, you can monitor who's uh, poaching them. Poaching yeah. the horns. So there are the so many, um, so many cases, yeah. yeah, that that aren't even if just like you're skiing and you yeah. get lost in the mountain. Yeah, you know. How, how do you guys think about some of the privacy implications you know, for having a lot more sensors and IoT devices and data collection? No problem at all because these are data on things. So we're not collecting data on humans. Right, it's a whole different protocol, right. a whole different network. We're not even on the same network. The, I think that the data can be, not can be, the data will be extremely valuable. And I think that uh, we'll see in twenty years, ten years time that that we have data sets that tell us exactly the best way to do everything, hmm. and that data will be worth a ton of money. Right. Right. So, you, I think you'll start be... to see data companies booming, data acquisition. We're already seeing it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> And I yeah. think that will become more of a thing. The more more data we collect on things, like if I know which hinges to put on the container ship, which hinges last the longest in salt water, and you are a shipping company, you would pay a lot of money for that data. Yeah, yeah. It's just like hyper optimizing everything, basically. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so let's get to this uh, device on the table for our listeners listening. There's a little model rover um, that's a part of some of the educational initiatives that you guys have. Tell us about this and what it is that you guys do. Well, that's a Lego robot. Okay. And um, it's actually the European Space Agency, Agency that told us we, we could really use in Europe an educational material that where we could teach SATCOM to children. Um, and on top of that, we could teach Explain IoT. Explain what SATCOM is for our listeners who might not know. So we have telecom is telecommunications and right. SATCOM is satellite communications. Okay. So it's almost the same thing, except when you send a signal into space, you have to treat it a little bit different because um, it gets perturbed on the way and there's radiation and right. there's Doppler and there's all this stuff. But so we are deciding, we decided to, we wanted to take that on and, and use our device and integrate it with a Lego robot mm -hmm. so that now children can build Lego robots and program not just the Lego robot where it's going and how it's driving, but also collect data from our SATCOM device because they can now in the same software get access to our satellite communication mm -hmm. modem. And they can control it and decide what data do they want to collect. And then they can also decide when it sends it, whether it's going to process it on board or not. And then they can sit in their classrooms down to like fifth, sixth grade yeah. and get the data down on some Excel sheets and learn how to analyze the data. Work with the data. And then also talk about why didn't we get these other packets that we were supposed to get from the satellite yesterday? Yeah. What happened? Uh, maybe there was a tree in the way. Um, we could also teach them how to uh, point, uh, like pointing exercises with the antenna to to hunt for the satellite. Yeah, because we 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 do that satellite hunting, right? It's fun. Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> so I think children um, they love space, they love Lego. So this was an easy way for them to get excited about engineering. And, yeah, and all teachers know how to build Lego. Mm -hmm. So we thought this is also easy for teachers to to get involved with. Very cool. And then we have. Um, we are flying it to the International Space Station Incredible! Uh, in August next year. So okay. we're handing it off to NASA in February. Uh -huh. They want it six months before launch. Uh, safety issues, I guess. But uh, we're going through all kinds of uh, validations right yeah. now with NASA, ESA, because uh, they want to make sure it doesn't blow up or burn mm -hmm. on the rocket or on the space station and that it doesn't hit an astronaut in the head. while right. or, Yeah. And then <laughs> we have invited all schools in our entire kingdom that means denmark greenland and faroe islands to write a program one program for each school where they can collect data from the space station Very they cool. can choose what data they want to collect do they what want are some examples of the types of data they well can maybe they want to investigate some some zero g some momentum studies like physics pure physics maybe yeah. you want to build the same robot on the ground and have the robots do the same exercise and and compare the differences right mm. maybe you want to you could use the accelerometer for that um, maybe you want to collect data on how busy is the European space module, you know, um, on a Tuesday compared to a Sunday. Or how What is the indoor quality like of living on the space station? Are they thriving or just surviving? Mm -hmm. um, what's the temperature like? Uh, things like that. How are maybe the sleep patterns or yeah. something? Well, sleep patterns not going to be a thing because we found out we have to tether our, our device 
they didn't approve the battery. The Lego battery has never been to space. Uh -huh. So to get that battery approved, we would have to wait six months of approvals. So Got we're it. risking the launch and the whole mission if we try to get that battery approved. So we've decided to just use the power supply from the space station yeah. to power our device. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, we're now enabling, yeah, our whole kingdom to get the data down and do the Incredible. data analysis. Yeah. And uh, What age yeah. uh, kids are they? From like fifth, sixth grade and up, depending on how motivated the children are. Sometimes you see children in third, second grade. My, my son was programming in this language when he was in zero first grade. Wow. Incredible. Yeah, so he was building me robots. He said, Mom, I made you a sandwich machine. <laughs> so a machine that could make sandwiches. Yeah. <laughs> and the kids love yeah. building robots. You yeah. Know? Do you guys have any plans to get this outside of Denmark as well and yes, make actually, it accessible to schools around the world? Uh, NASA has asked us what we want to do with it when it's done, when we're done with our mission. Uh -huh. Our mission is from August 2023 to February 2024. Okay. We have three options. So... One option is for it to stay in the space station so that other countries can benefit from it also. Uh -huh. That's my first wish. But to make that happen, I have to document the desire, okay. the need, the societal need. If if the planet says to NASA and ESA, we need this, we want our children to do this too, and society needs it, then they will let it stay. Okay. But if I don't collect that documentation, then then I have two other options. The second option is to... My second wish is to get it downloaded to Earth, meaning put into a capsule, uh -huh. a, a Crew Dragon capsule, back onto <laughs> to the planet. Right? Yeah. Um, then we can, that would just be for fun. I don't think there's a lot of societal benefit from it coming back to Earth, right. except for some PR and some excitement in schools and things like that. But the third, uh, if none of those things can happen, I can't document the need for any of those purposes, then they will trash it in space, meaning they'll just open up the, and let it fly float yeah so it sounds like um in order to keep the mission alive and not have it float endlessly in space <laughs> um countries like armenia even if they have interest they should express that interest through maybe like a letter of support or yes, something yes please send it uh off to our email address okay right here on my business card I, i'll try to me. get that information to the, to the right definitely. people definitely um yeah. i've also um spoken to some other people here that also uh like the American in, University in Ar awesome. Armenia. Yeah. So there's there's other en entities here that have yeah. an interest. So if you need me to help you uh, point those people out, if you want to make a, a collective, or, like yeah. with signatures, send to your government and say, Fantastic. look, we are a lot of institutions, universities, yeah. uh, nonprofits that, that believe we need to do this. And the government probably yeah. through the ministry or something. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Um, and if you have friends in other countries, who, yeah. <laughs> yes, please spread the word. Yeah. yeah. I'm from Canada, so I'll, I'll tell the yeah. Canadians to, to yeah, do it. Yeah, do it. Especially since yeah. Canada is a European Space Agency member. So that will be a lot. So, of course, ESA, if they get letters from the ESA member states, they will be of more importance than, mm -hmm. non -member than, than states. like Kenya or something. But we do also have an interest from Kenya and we have an interest from Brazil. Fantastic. Uh, so interest yeah. from Armenia would be great to add on to that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We'll try to work on that. Um, thank you guys both so, so much for, for joining us. This was really fascinating. I learned a lot from it. I've been saying that throughout these past two days at the at this conference. I just keep <laughs> saying I've learned so much from this conversation. It's um, great to be an interviewer. Yeah. Huh? I, I hope you guys, yes, it is. It's a, it's a great tool for both learning and just meeting a lot of new people. Um, so I hope you guys will come back to Armenia at some point and we'll be able to continue the conversation. Exactly. And thank if you're you guys in Denmark, so much. Thank you. Yes, us up. Thank you. for sure. Thank you guys so much. <laughs>